The year is 1978. President Jimmy Carter rides high as he shares a Nobel Peace Prize. But conflict continues in the Middle East as Israeli troops move into the Lebanon. The United States makes another leap forward in space technology as the shuttle is rolled out. And on the 15th of February, a man is arrested in Florida who eventually confesses to 23 murders. Nearly all the victims were young and pretty, with a strong resemblance to each other, and to a girl who once turned him down. The police were fairly sure he had killed at least 15 others as well. On the 15th of January, 1978, a student had been found in Tallahassee, raped, beaten, and strangled in the Chi Omega sorority house. Her name was Margaret Bowman. In a nearby room, also dying, was Lisa Levy. Her body had been savagely bitten. Also attacked, but alive, in the same sorority house, were these girls, Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. 90 minutes later, Cheryl Thomas was brutalized in her bed by the same man. Three weeks later, in Lake City, a 12-year-old schoolgirl disappeared. Kimberly Leach's body was found in a river two months later. The following week, a patrolman stopped a stolen car. The driver, here led by the police, said he was called Chris Hagen, but wouldn't give any more information about himself. Then he claimed he was Kenneth R. Meisner of Tallahassee, but this turned out to be just one of the names on the many stolen credit cards he had acquired. It took several days for the Florida police to realize they had caught the most wanted man in America, Theodore Robert Bundy. He was on the run after having escaped from Aspen, Colorado during pre-trial hearings for the murder of another pretty girl. So now the Florida police looked for any links with the recent murders and disappearances of young women locally. Bundy strongly denied all their accusations, quite confident that no evidence existed to link him with any of the brutal killings in the sorority house and afterwards. But his composure slipped when the police followed up the bite marks left on Lisa Levy. He violently resisted and six men had to hold him down in his cell to take wax impressions and these photographs. The pattern of his teeth fitted with the marks on Lisa Levy's buttocks. Now he set about charming his captors. Everyone who met Ted Bundy agreed that he was intelligent, cultured, and personable. Very few people could believe he was a crook, let alone one of the most savage serial killers ever. What they couldn't know was that he was a classic psychopath, internally raging and able to kill without remorse. Unusually for a serial killer, he was also very attractive to women, which was why so many girls fatally allowed themselves to be picked up by him. Ted Bundy was a charmer. He charmed the shoes off of him. He was um, thoughtful, charismatic. He was an enjoyable, likable, attractive person. Born illegitimate in Philadelphia in 1946, Bundy was an intelligent but lonely child. At Stanford University, he got engaged to a girl who had dark hair parted in the center, but she broke it off, saying he was emotionally immature. Psychiatrists have speculated that this was the trigger which set him off. Nearly all the 40 girls who were later to disappear when they came into contact with Ted Bundy had center parted dark hair as well. In California, he volunteered to help the local Republicans, but was soon in trouble for dirty tricks. When found out, he was boyishly unrepentant and typically charming. It's hard for me to believe that what I did is newsworthy, and my part in the campaign was so insignificant, I'm embarrassed that I should be getting this publicity from it, uh, really embarrassed. <laughs> At the end of the 1960s, he moved to Seattle, got a psychology degree, and entered law school. In 1974, girls started to disappear. 
On the 31st of January, Linda Ann Healy, a 21-year-old student at the University of Washington, went missing. Then Donna Mason, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College, never returned from a jazz concert. Susan Rancourt, another student aged 18, went to a movie and disappeared. Roberta Parks, aged 22, vanished on a late night walk. An unknown man left this bar, the Flame Tavern, near Seattle Airport with Brenda Ball. She was never seen alive again. Her ravaged body was found months later on nearby Taylor Mountain. With it were several other decomposing corpses, including that of the first Seattle victim, Linda Ann Healy. Then George Ann Hawkins, aged 18, walked back alone to her Washington University sorority house, but never reached it. The beach at Lake Sammamish was crowded on the 14th of July, 1974. A man called Ted, with his arm in a sling, asked several women to help load a boat onto his car. At least two refused, but Janice Ott, aged 23, agreed to go with him and disappeared. Soon after, Denise Naslund also went missing from the beach. Their decomposed bodies were found together near the lake on the 7th of September, along with those of another unidentified female. Other remains were found in the area too. Now the police had something to go on, since several girls could remember the man. They issued a photo fit picture, which turned out to be remarkably accurate. More women came forward when they saw it, to tell of having been approached by a man with his arm in a sling. There were eventually 3,500 suspects on the state computer. Number seven was Ted Bundy. But by the time the police reached his name, he had moved on. In August 1974, the disappearances in Washington ceased. Bundy was in Salt Lake City, and women started disappearing there. Nancy Wilcox, age 16, high school cheerleader, was last seen in a Volkswagen on the 2nd of October. Her body was never found. Melissa Smith hitched a ride on the 18th of October. She was found strangled. Laura Aim vanished and was slaughtered on Halloween. But Carol de Roche, age 19, turned out to be a tougher proposition. In the Salt Lake City parking lot, a phony cop got her into his Volkswagen, then snapped handcuffs on her. She managed to get away, but later she failed to recognize a photograph of Bundy. Over the next six months, a series of other girls disappeared in the Salt Lake City area. The last, on the 1st of July, was Nancy Baird, an attendant from this gas station in Golden, Colorado. On the 16th of August, 1975, Sergeant Bob Haywood challenged a suspicious Volkswagen. It drove off wildly. Stopped after a chase, it proved to contain masks and handcuffs. The driver was arrested. It was Ted Bundy. He was released on bail and set about charming his way out of trouble. And uh, yes, I intend to complete my legal education and become a lawyer and uh, be a damn good lawyer. And then I have a great model over here. So uh, I think things are going to work out. That's about all I can say. Forensic scientists had combed the car and found a hair that could have been Melissa Smith's. Witnesses also reported seeing him where one of the girls had disappeared. Carol DeRonch, who had escaped from his car after being handcuffed, picked him out of a lineup. When credit card slips proved he was lying when he said he had never been to Colorado, he was charged with kidnapping and attempted murder. Other states became interested. 
After a legal battle lasting 13 months, he was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping. He then faced further charges. I have got to keep myself together. I have got to stay calm. I've got to keep my presence of mind, because as long as I do that, I'm going to beat these people. His first attempt to beat them was an unexpected escape. Released from his chains and left in the courthouse library, he jumped from this window. The local sheriff was surprisingly relaxed. When was the last scene? Oh, about 10.30 this morning when he jumped from the window. Have there been any hostage-type yeah. situations or no. stolen cars no. reported? No. no. Just... While helicopters searched for him, he hid out in a cabin on Aspen Mountain for five days before coming back through the roadblocks to steal a car. He was rearrested a few blocks from where he had escaped. So now he slimmed down, until at the end of 1977, he was thin enough to make another escape. This time through a hole he cut in the ceiling of his cell. By the time the alarm was raised, he had driven to Denver in a stolen car and hopped a plane to Chicago. From there, he flew to Florida, where his urge to kill overwhelmed him. Shortly after the Tallahassee and Lake City killings, came his capture in the stolen car. Despite the telltale tooth marks, the state authorities were afraid they didn't have a certain case. They offered a deal, plead guilty, and they wouldn't request the death sentence. Bundy contemptuously refused. He also complained during the pre-trial hearings that his defense team had shut him out of preparations, but the judge was unimpressed. This court is finding clearly and unequivocally you've had the most excellent counsel I've ever seen any defense attorney in, this, in any defendant in the state of Florida ever had. Nevertheless, Bundy insisted on taking over his own defense, and the court had to rule on whether he was sane enough to be able to do so. The man is difficult to work with. He's almost uh, uh, cunning in the way that he works against his lawyer sometimes. And he reaches a level where he's unbearably hard to work with. But all of that uh, notwithstanding, the doctors told us that it does not meet the test for legal, <coughs> legal incompetence. As he took over, Bundy clashed with the trial judge, Edward Coward. Mr. Bundy? Yes, sir. The court wants to talk to you, man. Come up to the bar here. I want to tell you something, young man, that I want to tell you clearly and unequivocally so you understand. This court is not going to follow your schedule. Since I have been in Dade County, I've been allowed don't to... Don't shake your finger at me, young man. Don't, don't shake your finger at me, young man. Bundy had been protesting about not being allowed in the library to prepare his defense, and he continued with delaying tactics which had the trial moved from Tallahassee to Miami and put back from October 1978 to June 1979. When the jury had finally been selected, Bundy shrewdly won some key legal points, getting both his record and his taped statements ruled inadmissible. The policeman who made the arrest described how Bundy fought him, knocking his gun from his hand. He then went on to report what Bundy said when he was subdued. He made these statements several times on the way back to the station that he wished I'd killed him. Uh, on the way back to the station, he also made the statement, if I run into jail, will you shoot me then? With his law school background, Bundy was dispassionate and professional. Can you describe what you saw when you lifted up the cup? As much detail as you can recall. If you need to use your report, please feel free to do so. There was a considerable amount of blood around her head. Uh, matted in her hair on the walls. Uh, there was uh, what appeared to be a nylon stocking netted around her neck. And you cannot recall any debris other than blood? Is that your testimony? Is that your recollection? That's the best of my recollection, yes. Sir. Bundy claimed that the prosecution's exhibits could all be innocently explained. The masks found in his car were for skiing. The metal pipes were not weapons, but parts of his car. The nylon stockings, not for strangling, 
but for wearing. The prosecutor said that on the contrary, they all proved that the crimes had been carefully planned. This man premeditated this murder. He knew what he was going to do before he did it. He thinks he is smart enough to get away with any crime. The prosecution produced a key witness, student Nita Neary, who saw a man coming out of the sorority house that night. What I noticed most with the profile was uh, had a very prominent nose, uh, a straight bridge. It almost came to a point, not quite. Uh, very thin lips. Um. It was three in the morning. He was wearing a dark knitted cap and carrying a wooden club. Do you see that man in the courtroom? She was asked in one of the trial's most dramatic moments. Her response was clear. This was damning enough, but the clincher was the savage bite on Lisa Levy. The defendant in this case, Theodore Robert Bundy, was responsible for leaving those bite marks on the buttocks of Lisa Levy. Bundy claimed they weren't his, but dental evidence was overwhelming. Knowing that this was a critical point, he took the stand to deny it. What is your name, please? Theodore Robert Bundy. When you were arrested on February 15, 1978, in Pensacola, did you have a chip in your right front tooth? No, I did not. He used all his ingenuity to weaken the evidence. Then that evidence would tend to show that, in fact, my team could not or did not make those marks. Fully aware of the importance of this point, the state produced a further expert whose testimony was damning when asked to comment on Bundy's claims. In my opinion, the only set that could have caused uh, all the characteristics uh, in the photograph of the bite mark would be uh, number two. The models of Mr. Bundy? Yes, sir. The trial took a month, but on the 23rd of July, 1979, the jury needed only seven hours to reach their verdicts on a long list of indictments. The clerk of the court was handed the decisions. Could this impressive and articulate young man really be a wild sex killer? Publish the verdicts, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> in the circuit court of the Second Judicial Circuit in Infolian County, Florida, case number 78670, with the jury at Miami Dade County, Florida, this 24th day of July, 80, 1979, found the defendant, Bedore Robert Bundy, as to count three of the indictment, murder in the first degree upon one Lisa Levy. Guilty as charged, so say we all, Rudolph E. Trimble Foreman. The verdict was guilty, and all that Bundy could do now was to try to avoid a death sentence. With his usual cheek, he said that if he were sentenced to death, it would lower the court to the level of a murderer. I'm not asking for mercy. For I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. As Bundy's mother listened, the judge had no hesitation in passing the death sentence. She was struck several times about the head. She had a ligature around her neck, which was a pantyhose that strangled and caused her death. The beating was vicious, vile, and wicked and atrocious. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death by a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. However, Judge Edward Coward had extraordinary words of praise for his performance in the courtroom. It's a tragedy for this court to see it's such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. So he left the courtroom in Miami a condemned man to be taken to Orlando for another trial, this time for the murder of schoolgirl Kimberly Leach. In an extraordinary scene during this, he called his girlfriend, Carol Boone, to the stand and asked her to marry him. Will you marry me? Yes. And I do hereby marry you. 
She accepted, and they had a daughter during the years of his appeals. But extravagant gestures could not influence the verdict. Therefore, it is the sentence of this court as to count one of the indictment that you, Theodore Robert Bundy, be adjudicated guilty of murder in, fr in the first degree, and that you be sentenced to death for the murder of Kimberly Diane Leach. There followed almost nine years of appeals. One point which emerged was that Bundy claimed that he had been spurred on by pornography. Anti-porn crusaders leapt at this revelation as confirming their worst fears. Dr. Victor Klein, a psychiatrist who had made a study of the effects, summed up their views. They get into this pattern, it's a sexual addiction, and they act it out. And even good people can or are vulnerable to it. But lawyer John Weston took a sterner view. It's also a way for Bundy to check out uh, by, uh, in essence, saying the devil made me do it. Officials speculated as to how many women Bundy really had killed. My feeling is that he's killed uh, way over 100. When his last appeal failed, Bundy tried to delay his execution by starting to confess. His mother was devastated. We don't want to believe that these things happened, but... Uh, it sounds like at least some of them did, unless he's making it all up. Why would he make it up? When even this tactic failed, he used pleading. What I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is hmm. what people want with me, going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, and, and soothe the pain. But at last, nine years after the sentence, the state of Florida prepared for retribution. Press and angry crowds gathered outside the prison. At seven o'clock on the morning of the 24th of January, 1989, Ted Bundy finally went to the electric chair. Theodore Bundy was executed at 716 this morning in the electric chair at Florida State Prison. He was executed for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach of Lake City, Florida. As you know, he was also under sentence of death. An official eyewitness described his last moments. Ted Bundy was very shaken when he was brought into the room. He needed assistance. Uh, once he was placed into the chair, they began to put the straps around his ankles and his legs and his uh, waist area. He began to regain his composure. If I had to probably put a tag as to how he felt, it was, let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over. Shortly afterwards, the hearse took his body away past a cheering crowd. He will be remembered as one of the most cunning and prolific of serial killers, the model for such fictional counterparts as Hannibal Lecter, in Silence of the Lambs. In his final days, he left us with several quotes to ponder on. I'm the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. A lot of people are encumbered with a mechanism called guilt. I don't feel guilty for anything. I feel sorry for people who feel guilt. I just couldn't contain it. My time was used up trying to make my life look normal, but it wasn't normal. All the time, I could feel the force growing within me. I have a sickness. I just can't be around, and I know it now. 